Season 5 of Lost ended on one of its biggest cliffhangers. It left us with the tantalizing prospect that our Losties were about to change the future by detonating a hydrogen bomb at the Swan site. However, because the next season involved so much plot, mythology, and misdirection, some viewers are often left wondering, did the bomb actually detonate? What did the ending of season 5 mean? And what happened after Juliet struck the bomb and everything went to white? Initially at the start of season 6, it appears that the bomb exploded and destroyed the island, thereby creating an alternate timeline. However, by the end of season 6, we find out that the sideways reality is actually the gateway to the afterlife in which all souls pass through. It is completely unrelated to the events of the incident and the bomb in 1977. Jughead was used as a red herring to throw us off the true nature of the sideways going into season 6. This was previously discussed in detail in an FAQ on whether or not the characters were dead the whole time. So, since our losties don't actually change the past at all, what does that mean for Jughead? The whole point of our losties traveling to the past was to fulfill key causal events that shape their own future. These events include John Locke setting up his own destiny with the compass by giving it to Richard. Daniel Faraday telling the others to bury the U.S. military's bomb in the ground. Sawyer taking the rope through time, which thereby creates the dig site for where the Egyptians go on to construct a new donkey wheel chamber. The same wheel chamber that kicks off the time travel two millennia into the future. Saeed shooting young Ben and putting him in critical condition. Kate and Sawyer taking young Ben to the others, thereby officially making the boy one of them. Faraday being shot and killed by his own mother, Eloise. Jack carrying out the plan to blow up the Swan site with Jughead in the misguided hopes that it will change his future. And, most importantly of all, Juliet being pulled into the hole and hitting the housing of the bomb with a rock in order to detonate it. Because Jughead, absolutely, did explode. And, in doing so, saved the world in 1977. All of these events were part of a causal time loop that could not be changed, as our entire existence depends on them playing out. Remove one thread from this carefully woven tapestry and the whole picture unravels. So, what exactly happened at the Swan site after Jughead went off? It seems that Faraday never intended to freight the device in its entirety. What? He left detailed instructions on how to remove the plutonium core. And how to detonate it. Faraday told me that we needed to wipe out some kind of pocket of energy. Is only part of the bomb going to be enough to do that? The core itself is a thermonuclear weapon. It'll be more than enough. Notes from Faraday's journal helped Saeed to remove the bomb's core, which is all that was needed to create the necessary effect. Think of an unstoppable force meeting an immovable object, also known as the irresistible force paradox. Faraday said detonating a hydrogen bomb would render the energy beneath the island inert. To render the electromagnetic energy inert, it requires a greater pressure from the outside pushing down to cause the energy to collapse in on itself. The bomb is the catalyst to create an implosion, rather than an explosion. And it works to a large extent. The energy isn't destroyed or completely negated, but the bomb's pressure causes the energy to collapse inward, pushing it back underground. While the blast from the bomb is absorbed by the pocket, the two forces almost cancel each other out. The bomb's shockwave would most likely disturb the earth and cause the dig tunnel to collapse inwards. This would seal up any immediate leakage. This all happens within the space of seconds. From detonation to collapse. For our losties up above, once the bomb is triggered, they are instantly transported forward in time to the objective present day in the timeline. Because they have fulfilled their ultimate purpose in the past. Which was stopping the incident from growing beyond the dig site and saving the island from total annihilation. And, thereby, saving the world. The incident has come to an end in 1977. To any observers at a distance, such as Richard Alpert or Stuart Radzinski, they might merely see the bright flash of the light coming out of the tunnel. Much in the same way that John Locke saw the light when descending down into the well. Our time travelers would vanish in that flash of light. For Richard, who was allegedly watching all this unfold from the safety of the jungle, it would appear that Jack's group were vaporized by the blast. This is why he tells Sun in 2007. Yes, I was here 30 years ago. And I do, I remember these people, I remember meeting them very clearly because... 
I watched them all die. Meanwhile, Eloise Hawking would very quickly see that Jughead's detonation had not altered her circumstances at all. Nor had it erased the tragic events of this day. Our losties had failed to change things as they had hoped. All Jughead did was confirm Faraday's theory of whatever happened, happened. However, rather than changing the timeline, the bomb actually did the next best thing. It stopped the island from being totally destroyed from Dharma's drilling, effectively saving everyone's lives both on and off the island. Without Jack and his people traveling back in time, nothing will prevent Dharma from hitting this pocket and releasing the energy. And this disaster will go from being a mere incident that costs several lives, to a catastrophic extinction level event that kills everyone. And this is what makes Eloise understand that the future must happen as planned in order to ensure Jughead is always detonated at this point in the timeline. Even if that means she must raise her son to meet his fate at her own hands. The other success of Jughead's detonation is that it buys Dharma enough time to finish constructing the swan. They start by filling in the bottom of the dig site with thick concrete to seal up any remaining leakage. We see this more clearly in Season 2 when Saeed and Jack go below the swan to investigate what lies beneath. They find a concrete wall that surrounds the core of the station. Behind this wall is the original depth that the dig site reached. Think of it like a filling in a tooth that is exposed at the root. It is a temporary fix that will need to be monitored going forward. Because no filling lasts forever. The concrete helped to limit any exposure to returning personnel, but further safety precautions were almost certainly implemented for those working on the site. This is when the hazmat suits and gas masks were most likely introduced. Dharma initiative personnel would have been required to wear this safety gear when entering contaminated sectors of the island, or hotspots that were high in electromagnetic activity. Building the swan no doubt took a long time. When you look at the complexity of that station and its size, it would have needed at least a year to be completed properly. We also don't know how much the renewed conflict between Dharma and the hostiles might have delayed the construction. After all, now the cat was out of the bag and Eloise and Richard are aware that Dharma has been breaking the truce. Did the two groups parlay and discuss how the swan was now needed for the greater good? Or did they simply return to a Cold War footing? At this point, we can assume that Dharma was continuing their installation of the swan to monitor the electromagnetic anomaly they unleashed, and to observe any potential changes or fluctuations within it. They couldn't risk another incident. Once the swan became operational, they could more closely inspect the wider implications and properties of this energy. We know that Juliet's sacrifice had bought Dharma, at least, one to two years of no incidents because the station is finished. We also know that Dharma did not have need for the button or the computer during that time. This is based on the build of the hatch computer. It is assumed to be about 30 years old by the time the oceanic survivors come across it. Which would roughly place it around the early 1980s. While the computer is a composite of various vintage computing devices, it most closely resembles the design of the Apple II Plus, running an Apple III monitor with a Disk II floppy drive. The Apple II Plus was sold from June 1979 to December 1982. Dharma no doubt purchased several of these computers during this period and shipped them out to the island to update their technology. The earliest this computer could have been implemented is late 1979, which means Dharma had a significant period in which they could comfortably finish the swan. The orientation video for the swan is also dated 1980, in which the computer is both mentioned and depicted. Stuart Radzinski and Pierre Chang are almost certain to have designed and implemented safety protocols, since they got a front row seat of what the consequences would be if they ever dropped the ball again. By this point in the timeline, sometime between 1979 and 1980, the build-up beneath the concrete barrier had begun to metastasize to a point of critical mass. We can assume that the warning signs started with ground tremors and increased electromagnetic activity. The risk of another incident was looming under the island, and Dharma had to act. By installing an electromagnetic reactor. This reactor could absorb the charge of energy building up beneath the heart of the swan. They could channel the energy into the reactor and discharge the build-up safely. The computer is connected to this reactor. The video game Lost via Domus features an interesting depiction of what was sealed up behind the concrete wall. 
This is a very useful way of picturing what the computer was hooked up to and what the button was discharging each time. We can only speculate as to why Dharma walled off access to the reactor core, but it was most likely to avoid another meltdown. Perhaps the room became too unstable and dangerous to be in and, because of the high levels of radiation exposure, it would have needed sealing off permanently. Once again, in a similar fashion to how they dealt with the incident leakage. This is also highlighted during Season 2 when Saeed attempts to break through. On the other side of the wall is the reactor, where the buildup of electromagnetism is being channeled into and released every 108 minutes. This is the state our losties find the hatch to be in by the time they enter it in 2004. Some of this is speculation, of course. The series of events that occurred after the incident and during the swan's construction could have gone a number of different ways, depending on how much or how little the hostiles tried to prevent its completion. But Jughead detonating remains undeniable. There are some fans who still believe that Jughead did not explode and was somehow recovered from the dig site tunnel. They claim it was then installed beneath the fail-safe platform, and that when the key is turned it is actually detonating Jughead. This theory does not make much sense. First of all, Dharma would need to have known that Jack had dropped a nuclear bomb into that tunnel to begin with. And they had no idea what was left down there. Secondly, they would then need to have gone down there to retrieve it from the mangle of metal and debris. Thirdly, they would be required to keep this nuclear device safely stored somewhere for a long time until the hatch was ready. And finally, they would need to hook it up to a turnkey system. Surely, having a 25-year-old nuclear bomb located underneath the floor of a highly unstable electromagnetic station that was prone to earthquakes is a recipe for total disaster. I know health and safety wasn't a big thing back in the late 70s and early 80s, but come on. The fail-safe key wasn't connected to Jughead. It was connected to the reactor. And when the key was turned by Desmond, it detonated the core of the reactor. The full charge of the energy was absorbed into it, before collapsing back in on itself. Hence why we see the hatch imploded in the aftermath. Everything was sucked down into the ground. This wasn't a nuclear detonation. This was electromagnetic, and it wiped out the remainder of the pocket forever. There are two reasons why no one dared to turn the fail-safe key before Desmond did. The first was simply because Radzinski and his Dharma cohorts wanted to continue studying this energy in order to understand and harness its power. That was the primary objective of Dharma. But the second reason no one turned the key to solve the crisis was because there was no way of knowing what would happen to the person that activated the fail-safe. Radzinski would know that this would detonate the reactor core, and cause an implosion, but that might also mean the person down in the belly of the station would be killed as the swan collapsed in on itself. It was, in effect, a suicide mission to turn the key. Which is what Desmond thinks he is doing in the Season 2 finale. Desmond prepared himself for the fact that he was going to his own death down there. The only reason why both he and Locke, and Mr. Echo, are transported out of the hatch was because the island still needed them to participate within its tapestry of time. Desmond and Locke were really only just beginning their journeys. There may still be skeptics out there who simply do not accept that the bomb exploded. That what we saw happening at the end of Season 5 was not a detonation instigating a final time flash, but a time flash occurring and nothing more. The evidence to the contrary is clear and present within the show. First of all, we hear the sound of the bomb exploding as Juliet hits the housing. It is true that there is a time flash for our losties at the end of season 5. But the time flash is not unmotivated, nor does it simply randomly occur at this point during the incident. It still needed a catalyst in order to happen. The time flash occurs as a result of this detonation, which sends our characters back to the present day. Because they have done what the island needed them to do in the past. Ergo, stop the incident from destroying the world. Hello? This is also why Kate's ears are ringing when she wakes up in the present. The noise of the blast that blew them forward in time is still resounding in her eardrums because, for Kate, it only just happened a few seconds ago. Also note the distinct difference between the sound of a normal orchid-related time flash. This is not the same sound we hear when Juliet hits the bomb. 
It is even stated in dialogue how the bomb blew them forwards through time when Sawyer proclaims to Jack. You blew us right back where we started! Think about it this way. If the bomb didn't detonate in 1977 then the leak caused from Radzinski's drilling would have continued to intensify and suck everything into the tunnel. There is no way Dharma could have gained access to the dig site to pour in concrete while the energy was sucking the island into itself, especially anything made from metal or alloys. The only reason the incident stopped was because the bomb negated the energy long enough to fill in the concrete down below, allowing Dharma enough time to build the dam. The Swan was supposed to be a research station in which they could more closely study the effects of electromagnetic energy. But, because of the incident, it was turned into a world-saving barrier. None of this could have happened without something temporarily plugging the leak. Jughead put the pause on the apocalypse. That was the whole reason for our losties being in 1977. To save the world. For those interested in further supporting evidence for Jughead's detonation, it is worth reading the original script of the incident. Which is available online and should help to settle this debate once and for all. The final lines of the script help to clarify what exactly the writers intended. As always, thank you for watching. Please like, share and subscribe to keep this channel alive. Until the next time, stay lost.